Greetings from Church Street United Methodist Church in downtown Knoxville, Tennessee. I'm Anthony, a member and usher here at Church Street, and on behalf of my church family, I'd like to welcome you to our online worship service today. If you're new to Church Street, we'd love to connect with you. Please visit us at churchstreetumc.org to fill out the Connect card, and a member of our staff will reach out in the way that suits you the best. If you're already connected to Church Street, thanks so much for spending time worshiping the Lord with us today. We're glad you're here, and we hope you'll continue to stay in touch by using our online prayer request form or sending us your comments and suggestions. I'm standing next to what's called the Bishop's Chair, one of the oldest items in the church. It reminds me that this congregation, founded in 1816, has been touching lives in downtown Knoxville for more than 200 years. If you've been here, you know what a special place this is. If you haven't, I hope I can share it with you soon in person. Let us worship the risen Lord this morning. join me this morning in our call to worship. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. O taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in him.
Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, help us so to hear them, to read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that through patience and the comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and forever hold fast the hope of everlasting life which you have given us in our Savior Jesus Christ, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our scripture reading is from Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, starting with the 46th verse. They came to Jericho, as he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man, the blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go. Your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, this morning we find ourselves in Jericho. Remember when those walls came crashing down when Joshua blew his horn? Well, today there is another jarring marvel in this vicinity. In dramatic contrast to its desert surroundings, Jer Jericho was an oasis. In Jesus' day, it was affluent, and there were, it was really a crossroads, and people were migrating in all different directions. And so um, people uh, think, historians think, that panhandlers probably made a good bit of money there in this pl uh, place, and particularly the scripture tells us that this is uh, Passover, and so we figure that many people were passing through this city, and they were likely feeling very generous. Well, Bartimaeus is sitting low to the ground, and he's probably already collected a lot of cash that day, and he hoped to do even better for himself. The scientist Jonas Salk once said that true wisdom is recognizing a good thing when you see it. Well, Bartimaeus recognized a good thing when he saw it, even though he really couldn't see it. Ah, oh, yes, he was blind. He had probably never seen his mother smile, never seen the night sky glow with the, the, the million stars. He had never seen the beauty of flowers or butterflies or rainbows. No, he couldn't recognize a good thing when he saw it, but he could recognize a good thing when he heard it. His hearing had likely grown very sharp through the years. It's the brain's way of compensating for sightlessness. And so he is squatted there in a prominent spot in anticipation, listening to the excited chatter of passersby. The comment centered around the healer of great renown who was going to be passing through. When I was in graduate school in UT, I treated myself once a week to lunch at the Copper Cellar. My Wednesday routine rarely changed. I would sit in my red leather nook sipping tea, and I could look out over my menu through the window, and I could see Cumberland Avenue, and there I would see Professor Otis Stevens crossing the street. He was deliberate in step. He sauntered around every obstacle. He sidestepped all the distracted students who were focused on something else, and he confidently crossed the street, bounded up the curb, and soon he was coming through the door of the restaurant that I had just passed earlier. So as he came up, he would take his regular booth, the second one on the right, and after hearing the specials, he would select his entree. And as he waited, I noticed 
that his ears were tuned to both the television that was in the bar that was giving all of the uh, the sports data, the basketball uh, particularly was his interest. And then across the way, he would also listen to the newscast that was blaring somewhere in the ceiling in the other room. Few would have guessed that this man who was dressed so casually but was so confident was also blind. Some said he had hoped in er earlier years that his impairment could be rectified, but it never came to pass. He was mild in manner and ever approachable. His students revered him and nothing escaped him, they said. Dr. Stevens could repeat verbatim any intricate question that was offered in class. He could also often anticipate a question before it was even offered. Bartimaeus' ears were also well-tuned that day, and he was poised for the right moment. Soon came the commotion. He recognized the mass shuffling of the sandaled feet. He sensed the heated rush of the crowd, and he felt the rough fiber of linen robes brushing his face as they passed by. Then he perceived the nearing aura of Jesus himself. The miracle worker who had healed lepers, he had heard how he had made the lame walk again, and it even raised people from the dead. Somehow Bartimaeus knew that this was his chance of a lifetime, and it might just be hope against hope, but he was willing to try anything. And so just at the right moment, Bartimaeus throws convention to the wind, and he reaches out. Jesus, son of David, he cries out, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. I find it interesting that when Bartimaeus calls out, folks around him tell him to hush. We wonder what their reasons were. Maybe he was embarrassment. After all, he was a nobody. Decades ago, singer and songwriter and humanitarian John Denver was at the very height of his popularity, and he happened to be performing in Nevada. Some friends and I were among his biggest fans, and we happened to be there for a week of skiing. Now, for those of you who do not remember John Denver, he was as big as Frank Sinatra, and today probably parallel in popularity to Lady Gaga or Taylor Swift or someone like that. Well, my group, try as we might, could not obtain tickets for any of his performances. Then one evening, we were dining out at a restaurant, and who should walk by? John Denver. Of course, everyone started to stare and to wave at him. Then he passed our table. All of a sudden, someone from our group pushed back her chair and jumped up and started running toward the performer. I was mortified. Oh, no, Marcia, I whispered loudly. Don't do that. We're just peons. He doesn't have, he doesn't have any need uh, to bother with us. She didn't pay any attention. She only walked faster and began to shout loudly, Oh, Mr. Denver, John, Mr. Denver, John. And suddenly he stopped and turned around, and all the eyes in the restaurant were upon them. Then she continued speaking loudly. John said, she said, My friends and I are here from Tennessee, and we love your work. We tried everything we could to get tickets to your performance, and we stood in line, and we were just hoping. He looked at her through his gold-rimmed glasses, and he smiled and said, What's your name, and how many are in your party? Marcia Sweet, she said, and there are six of us. Then he took a card from his pocket, wrote his name and the date on it, gave it to her and said, come to the performance tomorrow at 8 o'clock at the club. Well, as you can imagine, Marcia Mar 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 squealed with delight. I confessed I was skeptical. Even the next night as I dressed, I thought to myself, there aren't going to be any tickets there. He was just trying to get rid of us. But that was not the case. For when we arrived, the doorman took our card and said, oh, yes. The sweet party. Come right this way. He led us to a table for six that had been prepared not very far from the stage. And we were in heaven. The band played and John sang his biggest hits from that day. Rocky Mountain High, 
take me home country road, sunshine on my shoulders, and so on. And then he ended his performance on a quiet note, and he sang his, his newest release. The refrain goes, follow me where I go, what I do and who I know. Make it part of you to be a part of me. Follow me up and down, all the way and all around. Take my hand and say you'll follow me. Sometimes impertinence pays off, doesn't it? My friend Marsha had chutzpah, and so did Bartimaeus. He totally disregarded the naysayers when he cried out, Son of David, have mercy on me. It's really an extravagant moment when you think about Jesus turning and bidding this pathetic beggar to come close. Immediately, Bartimaeus flings away his cloak and he leaps forward. Somehow he sees with the eyes of faith. What do you want me to do for you? asked Jesus. I imagine the entire crowd was waiting breathless, waiting to hear what he would say, although they knew he wanted to see, of course. But just moments later, they were telling him to shut up, but they listened. Jesus has seized this moment to redirect the crowd's attention to this human being in front of him. He was a man of value. For here is a man, very disheveled, of course, asking not merely for sight, but he's asking to be seen. Isn't that really what we all want? To be acknowledged and treated as a whole person, to be treated as someone of worth. How quick we are to shy away from those who look seedy and bedraggled. How often we rush by those who make us embarrassed in public. Years ago, when Reverend Harry Pritchard came, became the Dean of St. John the Divine in New York City, he was an avid runner. He wrote that when he first arrived in the city, he would be careful to fill his pockets with coins every morning before he headed out to jog. Then he would offer some of the coins to, in the cups of those hopeless beggars who were along the sidewalks when he passed. But after a few, moment, a few months, he noticed somehow he had, along the way, dropped that habit. He had become just like his fellow joggers, staring straight ahead, ignoring what was in front of him. He had just sides, he had, had missed all of those who were on the sidelines of life. I had eyes, he wrote, sadly, but I could not see. Yet here we see in Bartimaeus a man who has no vision, but he can see Jesus for who he is, the one who bestows mercy. What do you want me to do for you? Rabbi, he replies, I want to see. You may recall that Jesus had earlier posed that question to the two disciples who had approached him. And what was their answer? They said, oh, could we have those places of honor when we get to the kingdom? You know, the ones that are on the right and on the left. Now, throughout Mark's gospel, we know that Jesus has been telling his followers that when they get to Jerusalem, then he is going to be handed over to the authorities. He's going to be scourged, and he's going to be condemned to death and crucified. But James and John were focused only on themselves and on those seats of status. Then we have this outsider who has a heart full of hope. He may have already sensed what was in store for Jesus, but it didn't matter to him. When he cries, Son of David, have mercy on me, this is his confession of faith. Scarcely had the words left his lips when Jesus made sure light poured into his darkened eyes. Bartimaeus squints, and he opens his eyes again to see Jesus, the face of the one who has brought him healing. Before he saw with the eyes of his heart, but now he sees for real. If you and I scanned the Gospels, we would see that all those who had um, been healed by Jesus actually just sort of fade away into the background and you don't hear from them. 
But as soon as he is made well, we notice that Bartimaeus turns and follows Jesus along the way. He becomes a disciple, a disciple remembered by name. And did you notice that he doesn't retrieve his most precious earthly possession, his cloak? It was his sole source of warmth and his instrument of income. And within its folds were likely gobs of money. Maybe he leaves it there for some other soul who is suffering, someone who has also lost hope. Jesus asked the same question of us today. What do you want me to do for you? There are so many things you and I long for in this pandemic era. In our hearts, we wish for many things. We'd like for health to be restored to everyone. We would like for the pandemic to be over. We would like the freedom to gather with friends and family without fear. We would like to have a world of peace, at least some sort of normalcy. You and I can also ask for mercy in these times because the prophet Isaiah assures us that our time will come. The Lord is always waiting to show you favor, he says. I can picture Bartimaeus beginning that 18-mile trek to the holy city. He stooped over, I think, from years of crouching so low. His legs are wobbly because his muscles have atrophied. And with his bony fingers, I think he's probably shielding his eyes from the bright sunlight. But still he stays close to the one who had given him hope and who had given him a whole new life. They are off to Jerusalem where Jesus will meet his destiny. And as they approach the city gates, they will see the masses gathered there. They also recognize Jesus. They will be following Bartimaeus' lead. They will be flinging their cloaks on the ground, and they will be crying out, Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna to the Son of David. The road to Jerusalem is harsh and rugged. It is filled with danger and uncertainty. And like Bartimaeus, we don't see clearly. We see through a glass darkly. Our Lord is full of mercy, and he still hears us when we call. And even today, he holds his hand out to us, and he says, Follow me where I go, what I do and who I know. Make it part of you to be a part of me. Take my hand, he calls, and say, you'll follow me. Amen. Let us pray. O loving God, for the gift of worship, for the gift of this time to focus only on you, we give thanks. We call it our, our lives with so many things that do not nurture and do not sustain. Thank you for the gift of Sunday morning. Thank you for your scriptures and a community of faith in which to hear them. Thank you for the gift of one more day to know your love. We have heard the story of Bartimaeus and cannot help but think of our own desire to stay in the darkness. How grateful we are for your forgiveness and your grace that leads us to a life transformed and one bathed in light. Give us courage to take risks, which will result in not only our own transformation, but also the transformation opportunities for others. Forgive our stubborn insistence on living in darkness. Take our hands and lead us to the light, just as you did for Bartimaeus. You heard his cries when others would have silenced him. Teach us to be persistent in prayer and give us courage to ask plainly what we need from you, that we might respond in your name by the power of the Spirit, through the ministry entrusted to us for the sake of the gospel. You paid attention to the cries of a blind beggar when others would have ignored him. Teach us to be attentive to the voices others ignore that we might respond through the power of the Spirit to heal the afflicted and to welcome the abandoned for your sake and the sake of the gospel. Open our eyes around us and tune our hearts to pay attention. 
May we hear the cries of the lonely, the sick, the grieving, and the lost. Just as you reached out, empower us to reach out and to share compassion and good news. We pray that your spirit would dwell in us so that we might help others to see your grace and your love and your way. We pray this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us go forth as people of faith, remembering we serve a Lord who is ever ready to show us mercy and always ready to grant us hope. Let us go forth in peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.